All right, everyone. Today we start our journey into chapter 15, where we talk about a particular application or set of applications for equilibria. And we'll talk about precipitation and K-formation and K-dissociation of Lewis acid adducts and complex ions. So for 15.1, precipitation and KSP, there's your learning outcomes and expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those. All right, so 15.1, precipitation and dissolution. Turns out this is actually a pretty big section, and so we're going to break it out into subcategories. We'll talk about the solubility product first, KSP and how it relates to solubility, predicting precipitation, and then we'll close with the common ion effect. And so we have already talked about solubility, right? In chapter 11, we talked about solutions and whether one thing dissolves another thing. Uh, we used language like unsaturated and saturated and supersaturated. Uh, unsaturated means you can dissolve more. Um, super sa or saturated means you can't dissolve more. It's at its maximum uh, amount in solution. And then supersaturated is over that. And we talked about this in graphical form in terms of temperature versus solubility relationships. Again, we have the saturation threshold, we have unsaturated, and then we have supersaturated where a precipitate will begin to form. And so what we learned from this, and we had graphs that showed this, is not, not all salt, salts are equally soluble, right? Some lines are higher up on the curve, some are lower, some have different temperature dependence. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is why? And so something like sodium chloride, when we throw that in water, it's gonna completely dissolve. In fact, you can add a surprising amount of sodium chloride before you see a solid starting to form. It's readily soluble. And so we depict it by an equation that looks like this, NaCl going to Na plus and Cl minus. But there are other salts that are only sparingly soluble. Something like silver chloride, it only puts a few Ag plus and Cl minus. This is thousands of times less soluble than NaCl. And so consequently, while we draw a unidirection arrow for NaCl, which largely goes completely to ions and uh, is a strong electrolyte, AgCl, on the other hand, um, we draw a double-sided arrow, and we describe this as an equilibrium, just like we've covered in chapter 13 and 14. But in this case, we're going to apply this equilibrium equation uh, to solubility. And so as such, we can follow the original rules we had in chapter 13. Uh, capital K, the equilibrium constant, is equal to products to stoichiometry over reactants to the stoichiometry. But in this case, we have a product that's these aqueous ions, and we have a reactant that is a solid species. Solid species don't show up in the equation, and so we have products times each other to the stoichiometry is equal to K. And so because this is a special equilibrium, or a particular equilibrium that's fairly common, we add these subscript SP. And so this is a... a the solubility product constant. So it's still the same equilibrium constant we covered over and over again. Products over reactants, large number favors products, small number favors reactants. All the rules of Le Chatelier, everything we discussed in chapter 13 still applies to this K, but we're gonna add this SP, which lets us know immediately that this is a solubility product constant. So it's a solid going into ions in the solution. And so the general form of this holds true just like it did with everything previously. We have some ions being formed, that's A and B here, from a solid. And so we have products to the stoichiometry over reactants to the stoichiometry, reactants as a solid doesn't show up in the equation. This is the general form of the solubility product constant. And so we can basically take any salt that will dissolve in a solution and we can separate it into ions. And so AgCl gives us Ag plus and Cl minus. MgF2, this gives us an Mg2 plus, one of those, 2F minus ions. Uh, so on and so forth. And so we can draw our KSP equation directly from these. And so we can say Ag plus to the 1, Cl minus to the 1 from the stoichiometry, Mg2 plus to the 1, F minus to the 2. <coughs> and again, it's from the stoichiometry. And so yeah, same rules as chapter 13, but we're applying this to a solubility product. And so we can numerically define how soluble things are. Remember, a large K value favors products. In this case, products is the ions in the solution. And so the larger this KSP number, the more soluble it is. The smaller this number, the less soluble it is. And so you can see through these range of values, it can vary dramatically, right? So this is this bismuth sulfide is a 10 to the minus 72. It basically says it favors being solid by 17, 72 orders of magnitude. So very, very insoluble, whereas something like sodium chloride doesn't even have numbers on this table because it's going to be large, right? Like it's going to favor products. It's going to be, you know, over a thousand or something like that. And so you can see a range of numbers, but the point to take home from this is this number tells us how much we can get into solution. It tells you how soluble that species is going to be. And so the take home in terms of KSP or any equilibrium constant, large K favors product, 
uh, small K favors reactants. Um, the larger the K, the more it favors products. The smaller the K, the less it favors products. And so in this case, as the KSP goes up, the solubility of the salt increases. And so we have a few different ways to describe solubility. We've talked about a few of these when we were in chapter 11, but uh, some of the more common ones, we have this equilibrium constant um, that tells us a ratio of products to reactants. We also have something called molar solubility, which is basically the moles of solute per liter of solvent. And we can talk about the solubility, and this is what we usually see in the graph. It's effectively grams of solute per liters of solvent. And so these, these terms are related. You can effectively convert between molar solubility and solubility pretty easily. The only difference between them is this is expressed in grams, this is expressed in moles. And so you can convert molar solubility to solubility via the molar mass, and likewise solubility to molar solubility via the molar mass. And so they're describing the same thing. One's describing it in moles, one's describing it in grams, but they represent the same thing for the most part. And so the question is, how do we relate this KSP to these guys? And so very similar to what we had previously, we have this KSP. Um, one of the things we can do is set up this equilibrium equation. And if we want to calculate the amount of Ag plus and Br minus in solution, we can do it through ice table math. All right. And so in this case, we have solid. We're going to throw that in solution. This is going to decrease. The amount of uh, the ions in solution is going to increase by, in this case, they do S. You could do X as well, minus X plus X plus X. This does show up in the calculation so you can ignore it and then you have s and s and so you can plug these into this ksp equation and we can get to this ksp is equal to ag plus times br minus the concentration of these at equilibrium will be s and so in this case it's effectively s squared is equal to the ksp value 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 13 and the square root of that gives you the answer of 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 7. and so from this value uh, what's interesting about this is it doesn't matter what concentration you start with because it's, it's a solid, right? That's not in account in our KSP calculations. All that matters is how many ions you're getting into solution. So presuming you have enough solid to generate 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus seven molarity, it will go to complete um, uh, saturation and you'll have this amount in solution. And so it turns out we don't have to do that ice table math. What's really convenient about this, going back to this calculation, is, again, we don't have anything in the denominator, right? Because this, this solid is ignored in the KSP equation. And so it turns out the math becomes really easy, right? Whether this is 2s squared or 3s cubed or 2s squared times 3s cubed, it doesn't matter, right? They're, they're, the math is going to simplify to a straightforward equation. You don't have to worry about quadratics. You don't have to worry about neglecting x, or in this case, s. Instead, it's a pretty straightforward relationship because the concentration if there's stoichiometry is one is s times s ksp equals s squared right and so if the the stoichiometry is two here you're gonna have 2s and s it'll be 2s squared times s it gives you ksp equals 4s cubed and so you can think this through i mean you could memorize it but it's probably not worth it because if you just look back at this equation here this is s this is 3s 3 cubed is 9 s cubed is 3 and so you're gonna have um uh, uh uh, sorry, three, uh, 3 cubed is 27. You're going to have 27 times s to the fourth, and that's exactly what you get in your KSEP equation. So we can greatly simplify our math. Note that this is still doing effectively ice table math, but it's doing it a really straightforward way because there's no denominator here. So we can convert KSP to s. We can convert s to um, uh, solubility in terms of grams per liter. Um, all of those are interrelated. And so when we draw this graph again, this, this case it was grams of whatever per, or kilograms per 100 kilograms of water. You could use any in, units on this axis you wanted to. Um, uh, even KSP is going to change with temperature. Uh, but the point is when you're talking about solubility, molar solubility, KSP, you're effectively describing this line right here, right? It's this saturation threshold, like how much, what's the maximum amount that I can dissolve at a given temperature? KSP tells me that value. That's the saturation threshold. That's how much I can get into solution and so uh when you when you're talking about you know this ksp solubility more molar solubility you're talking about the maximum amount that can go into solution the actual amount is something you'd have to determine right experimentally or something like that unless you know you're putting enough solid in there to generate a saturated solution then you know it's going to reach this threshold but um it, it could be more it could be less depending on how you prepare the solution and so this number tells you the maximum amount but it doesn't tell you the actual amount which is something you'd have to figure out from measurements or or as we'll see in a little bit from a Q value. 
And so we have our solubility product, this KSP value. We've related KSP to solubility and molar solubility in terms of moles per liter grams per liter and K equilibrium constant. And so we can use this to start predicting precipitations. And so again, we have this equation. KSP is equal to A to the stoichiometry, B to the stoichiometry. We could go through, do our math, and figure out those values. But ultimately, we need to determine this experimentally. Is it at this equilibrium uh, concentration? And so for this, we go back to our... our, our uh, our Q value, right? Our, our equilibrium quotient. And so this is the same equilibrium quotient we saw in chapter 13. Uh, but instead, in this case, we're going to call it the ion product quotient, um, or Q is the ion product, and basically says we're going to do this Q calculation, and we can do it at any concentration of A and B, right? K is particular to equilibrium. Q we can calculate at any time. And just as we saw in, in chapter 13, Q doesn't have to be equal to K. If Q is equal to K, we're at equilibrium. But if we calculate Q and it's not equal to K, then something is happening, or something's different than equilibrium condition. And so we effectively have this this new set of rules and it's the same set of rules we had in chapter 13 talking about q versus k but now we're going to talk about it in terms of solubility and so here's your list right if q is equal to k you are at equilibrium and equilibrium for a ksp means it's a saturated solution if q is less than k then it's an unsaturated solution it basically says um, there's too much of this not enough of this or there's not enough of this we don't know how much of there is of this but there's not enough of this and so it's an unsaturated solution if Q is greater than K, it means there's too much of this in solution and it's super saturated. And it can be stable, super saturated, but eventually a precipitate is going to form. And so you have this Q greater than K effectively means you have too much of this and it'll precipitate a solid. And so we can go through and just do a quick example of this. We basically have this mixture of silver chloride and the question tells us this one's at equilibrium. What are these three? Are they it's unsaturated, saturated, super saturated? We can predict whether a precipitate will form. And so we don't have concentrate, <laughs> concentration numbers, but we can just count the number of ions um, just as a, a, a means of, of determining a relative value. And so remember, if Q is less than K, it's unsaturated, doesn't have enough products. Q is equal to K, it's saturated. Q is greater than K, it's super saturated, and a precipitate will form. And so we know that the first one is at equilibrium. And so we can count, there's, you know, four yellow spheres, there's four silver spheres. We have an equal number of silver and chloride ions, um, which makes sense. And so we can plug those numbers in, we can get a KSP value of 16. Note that these aren't concentrations, but whatever numbers we put in there, they're proportional because the volume is the same and it, can, it effectively balances out. And so we can use this KSP of 16 as our baseline. And then we can look at these guys and say, okay, are they, is Q greater than K, less than K, or equal to K? And so we can do our Q calculation at any time. We don't know a priori whether it's going to be any of those answers. And so put our numbers in. Let's do our calculation here. We have five yellow, five silver, five times five. Q is 25. We can do the math on this one. We have three and three. Q is equal to 12. This one, we have a disproportionate number of ions. We, <laughs> we have two chloride ions, and then we have eight silver ions, um, which is conveniently called, called, called silver. And so we get a Q value of 16. And so all of a sudden we can use these Q values to predict unsaturated, saturated, or super saturated. And so in this case, we can see for B, Q is greater than K. If Q is greater than K, there's too much products, not enough reactants. It's going to shift left, and that shift left on this one is going to be a precipitate forming. And so we can predict that this solution will precipitate, I mean, in this case, it'll precipitate one pair of uh, silver chloride ions until it reaches that equilibrium. We look at um, condition C, a Q value of 12. Q is less than K, it is an unsaturated <laughs> solution. We could add more solid and it would become saturated, or we ran out of solid and it can't become saturated. But the thing we know about it is it's an unsaturated solution. And then we look over at D, eight times two gives us 16, Q is equal to K, this is at equilibrium. And so this one to actually exist because the charges aren't balanced, but you guys get the idea that you, you, if Q equals K, you're at um, saturation, you are uh, equilibrium condition. If Q is less than K, it's unsaturated. Q is greater than K, a precipitate will form. Of these reactions, B is the only one that'll form a precipitate. 
All right, so we're going to close out chapter or section 15.1 with something called the common ion effect. And this is another one of those that you guys have seen before, um, but we're going to put it in the context of KSP and solubility of ions. And so common ion effect is the shift in equilibrium caused by the addition of compound to having an ion common with the dissolved substance, um, which is just a fancy version of Le Chatelet's principle. And so let's look at this equilibrium again. We have silver chloride turning into silver ions and chloride ions. So you put your solid, solid AgCl in there. You get some Ag+, plus, you get some Cl-. minus. What happens if I add Ag+, plus, right? And so in this case, I'm going to do it in the form of this AgNO3, which is a really soluble salt. I'm going to add a bunch of Ag+, plus to this solution. Well, what happens to this equilibrium? From chapter 13, we already know the answer, right? And so we're going to add this Ag+, plus, which in this case is called a common ion because it's common to the equilibrium ions here. If this goes up, it's going to shift left. It's going to precipitate more, right? And so if Ag plus goes up, Q is greater than K. It is super saturated. It is going to form a precipitate as we add Ag plus. And so the, the, the memorized message, which I wouldn't recommend memorizing, is the presence of a common ion decreases the solubility of a salt. And the reason that happens is you have products, you're adding those products, it shifts to the reactants. Reactants in this case is a solid, which means you're facilitating the precipitation process. And so if you want to pull a bunch of Cl minus ions out of solution, increase the amount of Ag plus, shift it to left, get more AgCl solid out of the solution. And so you can see this graphically. Uh, this is actually molar sol solubility of calcium fluoride versus the concentration of sodium fluoride. And so here we put calcium fluoride solid in solution. You got some Ca2+, plus, got some F-, minus. we're going to add sodium fluoride. In this case, uh, sodium fluoride is really good at uh, dissociating and making F- minus ions. So we have one equilibrium. We have a salt that we're adding to it, which is generating adding F- minus ions. Note the Na+, plus doesn't do anything because it's not in this equilibrium. But we're adding F minus, which is a common ion. F minus goes up, the concentration of calcium 2 plus goes down, the amount of CaF2 formed in the precipitate increases. And that's exactly what we see in this graph, right? As the concentration of F minus increases, the solubility of CaF2 decreases. And so you add more and more and more, and the solubility decreases um, as you add more F minus to it. And so again, a small amount of F minus shifts a little, large amount of F minus shifts a lot. Uh, essentially the small amount, you have a smaller Q, well Q is still greater than K, but you add more F minus and Q is much greater than K and it has to shift to the left to generate that solid. So yeah, the, the, so the, the general rule again, you add this common ion, it becomes less soluble. The more of that common ion you add, the less soluble this system becomes. And so there's our, there's our summary. We have this solubility product constant, KSP follows all the K, capital K, equilibrium constant rules we have from chapter 13, but we're gonna do it for a solid dissolving in a solution, generating ions. Larger that value, the more soluble. Um, uh, the, the smaller that value, the less soluble. We can relate things like molar solubility, which is moles per liter, to solubility, which is grams per liter, to KSP. It's essentially through an ice table, but it simplifies the math quite a bit. Um, the the definition of solubility or KSP solubility and molar solubility is that maximum threshold that you can reach with a given salt of some kind. It doesn't mean it has to be that concentration, but it means that's the maximum you can get in solution. And so you can figure that out from this Q value, this um, reaction quotient effectively. If Q is equal to K, it's at saturation. Q greater than K, super saturated. Q less than K, unsaturated solution. And you can predict whether a precipitate will form if Q is greater than K. And so a case where Q becomes greater than K is something called the common ion effect, which again is Le Chatelet's principle. You're adding products, it has to shift to the left. In the case, this case, left is giving you more solid and less ions in solution. The solubility of the salt goes down with a common ion. All right, so that closes out chapter or section 15.1. Um, next, we'll dive into a, a, another equilibrium, which is re regarding uh, Lewis acids and bases.